good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next SEBRA webinar, or as we like to refer to them, a SEBRINA. So my name is Jessica May, and I am the Acting Lead of Innovation, Legislation and Education uh, in the Biosecurity Strategy and Reform Division. So firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we are meeting today. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on. For me here in Canberra, this is the Ngunnawal people. I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. I extend that recognition to the traditional custodians of all other lands on which our staff and participants are gathered today and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people attending today's events. So today we are meeting with Tom or Tom is giving us a presentation but before we start I would like to ask everyone to ensure your microphones are on mute and your cameras are off. Uh, the webinar is being recorded today for those who could not make it. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end so during the presentation you can either use the hands up gesture at the end or you can put questions in the comments on this chat panel on the side as we're going along. So as a recap the Centre of Excellence for Biosecurity Risk Analysis, or SEBRA, is a long-standing biosecurity research initiative and plays a vital role in providing the Australian and New Zealand governments with expert biosecurity risk analysis and advice that helps inform a range of biosecurity risk management activities. So today's webinar will feature work undertaken by SEBRA to integrate a large dimensional climate and trade model with a trade exposure model for possible pest incursions with global warming. The resulting framework indicates the various risks of high threat pests entering Australia and their links to trading partners under different climate and trade scenarios. So today to explain more on this we have Professor Tom Compass who is a Chief Investigator with SEBRA. Tom is a specialist in the economics of biosecurity with a recent emphasis on optimal surveillance, environmental costs and benefits and the allocation of investments across the spectrum of biosecurity threats and measures. Tom is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences Australia, a recipient of the Eureka Prize in Science and a distinguished fellow of the Australian Agricultural and Resource Economics Society. That's a mouthful. Uh, he is also Research Group Director of the Centre for Environmental and Economic Research at the University of Melbourne and the Foundation Director of the Australian Centre for Biosecurity and Environmental Economics at the Australian National University. So on that note, I will now hand over to Tom to get us underway. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, the, the, short, the short bio is that uh, I'm an applied mathematician and an economist who loves large dimensional computational modeling. And all of that put together is typically a conversation stopper, uh, but hopefully not today. I'm happy if you if you chime in later with questions or contact to contact me after the fact to uh, uh, to follow up on some of the material I'm talking about. Thanks to my DAF colleagues. Fantastic to be part of the of the seminar and also also to other people who are joining friends and colleagues and uh, people in the Society for Risk Analysis Conference who are also tuning in. So that was a, a, a really nice surprise. Happy to have everyone here and happy to, well, thanks for tuning in everyone. So I'm gonna share, share my screen, hopefully without incident. Bit of a problem. Okay, good. Can you see the main panel for the PowerPoint? Someone just say yes and then I'll be happy to go on. Yes. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So I'm presenting today, but there's a big team behind this project. And I, I've listed, and I may have missed some, in fact, I've listed most of the team members on the front page, um, particularly James Kamak and Fon Van Ha, Christine Lee, Matthew Cantell, Andrew Robinson at SEBRA, um, but also a huge group at uh, the Department of Agriculture. And I'm sorry, I haven't, I haven't changed the name back to DAF yet. That's a bit of an error. Um, Recently, they've been providing us with a lot of interception data and other kinds of data sets, it's just been fantastic. So it's it's really good to be working with the, the DAF team. There's also a group at Scion in New Zealand. We tried this model in a preliminary sort of form uh, some time ago and still working on it. So thanks to any of my New Zealand colleagues who are turning in, tuning in today. I appreciate that. So big team, um, I'm happy to present. So overall, the project in a sense is pretty clear to articulate. We want to think about, we want to map the connection between economic damages from global warming in a large dimensional computational framework, a large dimensional climate and trade model, 
and how that affects national incomes across 140 different countries and 60 different commodity groups, and then how those changes in national incomes affect the pattern of imports and exports going forward. In fact, the changes there are quite profound. You get huge changes in the pattern of trade as a result of global warming at various RCPs. And indeed, we can do all RCPs in this, uh, in this climate and trade model. And then given the changes in trade and trade, trade sort of impacts that go with global warming, we want to ask the question, what's the result in terms of pest pathways along those trading networks? How do they change? How would we expect new pests and diseases to enter Australia, given the change in trade, given the change in incomes, given the change in trade patterns as a result of global warming. In a way, it's, it's sort of just that simple, uh, but computationally quite hard to do. Uh, and that's, that, that's what makes it sort of interesting, I think, and fun for us. And as, as Jessica said, the whole idea is in effect to try and determine what sort of pests and diseases might be coming um, to Australia and other countries, of course, with, the, with changes in in uh, temperatures and global warming. I'm gonna concentrate mostly today on the climate change model. You've, if you've been into seminars before, uh, prior to today, you saw Christine Lee presenting on damage functions, and I'll just splash something on the screen to show what that involves. Uh, these are damages that come with global warming that affect incomes, principally through changes in agricultural and with it labor productivity, but other impacts as well. I'll just mention that briefly. Um, if you saw her presentation, you're already up to speed. And some time ago, James K. Mack presented on changes in pest path pathways and used BMSB, a brown mar marmalated stink bug, as an example, given changes in trade patterns. We're at the final stages of trying to loop that material into the climate change model, but we're not quite there yet. We're still getting the data together, and it looks like it's really going to be a, a crackerjack in the end. So. I'll, I'll, I'll flip through a couple slides on James's material as well, just to give you some, some context in terms of what we're doing going forward. But again, most of what I'm gonna do is talk about the climate change model today. So just a little reminder, uh, global temperatures on average are rising. The black line here is the average temperature. The blue line is ocean temperature and the brownish line is land temperature. Average temperatures are now roughly around 1.2 higher than pre-industrial. On land, they're getting close to two degrees on average. Important to keep this in mind because when we do the economic damages from climate change in this presentation and in the work we're doing, um, most of those damages accrue on land. So even though the climate model we use, which is a smaller version of what's called Magic C with various RCPs, uses the average temperature, in fact, it's the land temperature that's probably most telling here. So if anything, the damages might be understating the impacts as a result of global warming, given that land temperatures seem to be rising much faster than the average. But the bottom line is pretty clear. There's global warming, temperatures are increasing, and that's gonna generate a, a host of damages, both economic and environmental, and all kinds of damages that are relevant. So keep that in mind. So, I'm not going to go through the technical material on the climate change model, the climate and trade model. It's a it's what's called a CGE or GTAP model, but a large dimensional one with forward looking behavior. Um, CGE models, very simple, really. They're just trade and economic activity models. They 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 sort of roll out in a way in a very straightforward sense. A lot of a lot of text on this page, which which uh, some of my colleagues won't like, but let me just take you through it. Um, a CGE model does this. It maps inputs in each country, land, labor, capital, intermediate goods, natural resources. It maps all, those, all of those inputs into outputs. So 60 different commodity groups, which I'll show you in a minute in the CGE model that we use for each one, again, of 140 different countries. So it's inputs to outputs. Those outputs can be consumed domestically <clears throat> or they can be traded. And so what you do is you get a pattern of exports and imports across the world, across all of these countries in terms of local production of goods and services. There are households in the model, there are firms in the model and governments in the model. So you're just really looking at the impacts and in that context of what global warming will do to the output of goods and services and how that again will affect trade patterns. 
Now, what's different about our CG approach, if there are any CG modelers on, on board in, in this presentation, really there's three main points. First of all, as I said, it's large dimensional. So the model ranges anywhere from 30 to 140 countries, and I'll show you the 140 country case today, and up to 60 different commodity sectors. So it captures the full heterogeneity of damages across the, the globe. And this is important. Early economic models of climate change tended to aggregate or average uh, quite severely ac across countries and regions. Uh, the famous Nordhaus model had only 10 regions initially, and many of the CGE models still stop at 20 or 30 regions. I mean, they have a place, but what you do when you do that sort of averaging is miss all the heterogeneity, you miss the distribution of the damages that are really quite relevant in terms of individual country experience and how trade patterns matter going forward. So. Um, I've come to hate averages. I don't like averages anymore. I want to see the full distribution, particularly when it comes to these, these uh, trade and climate models. And you'll see what I mean. I'll show you a graphic that makes this clear. The second key point is it's forward looking. So firms and house, households partially, at least partially anticipate future changes in, in things like emissions reduction targets or carbon prices or damages from climate change. Uh, sea, sea level rise and storm impacts and so on. They anticipate some of these things going forward. In standard CGE models, um, they have a recursive structure where individuals only form forecasts of next period's prices based upon current and past prices, what's called an adaptive expectations mechanism. We've got forward-looking behavior, and I think that's better. I think it's necessary to do that in a climate change model, right? Government sets a target for 2030, as Australia does. Now you can start to take that into account in your planning. What's also good about it is that you can't be arbitrary about the path going forward because the path going forward has an optimal characteristic. Economists love optimization and, and this model has that built in. So the path in a sense is hardwired uh, given an optimal outcome to steady state in this model in 2300, typical for climate change sort of modeling. Whereas in recursive models, the path is really sometimes arbitrary, and I sometimes wonder about that. The last, the last key point is it's fully integrated, right? So it's a scaled down version of a climate change model that's common here at Melbourne Uni called Magic C, and it integra integrates those sorts of RCPs and SSPs, if you know these, these sorts of uh, uh, categories into changes in production, trade, and income. So it's fully integrated. It includes the climate, it includes trade, it includes uh, production, all in one sort of model setting. That's the pitch, that's why we like it. So there are a number of different commodity groups here and I've just listed some of them. It says 57 plus, but now we're up to about 65, I think really. Um, it depends on what version of the model we're using. You can see it's pretty heavy in agriculture, which is good for biosecurity concerns. But it's also also got all the all the sort of other things you might think of when it comes to manufacturing and energy production in particular. So it's got fossil fuels, it's got renewables, it's got all kinds of uh, services and goods that are relevant to to manufacturing, along with the agricultural components. So we track all of these across all of the countries. Again, you're mapping inputs, land, labor, capital resources and intermediate goods into outputs, and these are the outputs. These are the goods that are being produced. And then either, again, consumed domestically or traded overseas, depending upon uh, consumer demands and context. Now, so to get this model to work, you have to introduce what are called damage functions, climate change damage functions with, again, which again, Christine talked about quite 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 a bit uh, two seminars ago. I just want to take you through the, the, the ones that we're working on here at, at SEBRA. These are the various damage functions that we're trying to build into this climate and, and trade model. You can see there's, there's a lot of heat stress and agricultural productivity that's relevant for us. We look at heat stress in terms of losses in yield. Um, that's been completed, that's peer reviewed, it's been published. I'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, we also look at the effects of heat stress and precipitation changes on agricultural productivity losses. This is Christine's work with help from the whole team. And then heat stress and labor productivity, whether what we use our, our standard sort of wet bulb globe indices. Um, all of those three are used in Project 21B, this SEBRA project that we're talking about. Those first three in the vertical column are all the ones that are being fed into this model. 
We're going to try and get other things into the model at some point, particularly if the, if the project is extended. We've got some work on, on floods and fires, right? Because at the moment, we're just looking at, at sort of heat, heat stress, and in terms of losses in agriculture and labor productivity, we want to do more eventually, although that's a major part of the damages that are coming. There's also floods and fires, as we know all too well in Australia. And there's some recent work on a water stress index for losses in agricultural output and measures of food insecurity. We're really quite keen on food insecurity these days and trying to map that out quite clearly in this context. So indeed, the whole goal is to find a, a mapping between water and heat stress and its impacts on production going forward and with it, its impacts on country GDP. We also at several work quite a bit on sea level rise and storm surge. There's a big report on Victoria coming out in about after the election in about three weeks. So keep an eye on that. And we've got results globally and for selected countries in terms of damages from sea level rise and storm surge. And they are really quite uh, scary. And finally, we're looking at losses in biodiversity with Brendan Wintel and a group here at Melbourne Uni and uh, through an ARC council project. And um, we're also part of, of what's called the HEAL network, trying to map uh, changes in global warming to changes in human health in terms of pollution and also, in fact, in terms of the, the sort of um, um, transmission of infectious uh, infectious pests and diseases around the world. Uh, there's a group called EpiWatch that I work with, and again, the HEAL network. So we're trying to do all of these things, trying to fill in all of the damages that are relevant with global warming. But the initial first cab off the rank is heat stress and um, terms of losses in labor and agriculture productivity with some minor limited sea level rise uh, in terms of losses in arable land. So that's where we are. So to calibrate these damage functions, I'm going to splash something on the screen just to impress you. This is the sort of model framework, the statistical model framework that Christine uses to sort of form a mapping between changes in temperature to changes in yield for major agricultural cropping patterns. Um, so it's change in yield as a function of change in temperature, change in precipitation, um, change in CO2 levels, and a whole series of uh, dummy variables and random country intercepts and so on. So it's a, it's a fairly sophisticated, in fact, very nicely sophisticated computational exercise, statistical exercise, to try and map out what this linkage is between change in temperatures and change in, in yields outputs of, of major agricultural commodities. And she so showed you a picture a couple of weeks ago. This is the one without precipitation included. It's just the heat stress index, I guess. Yes, just the temperature index. Um, brown here is bad and green is good, as you would expect. And I've just showed you two examples from her work, one for soybean and wheat. It shows what happens when you increase temperatures on average globally. You start to experience considerable falls in yields across these two commodities. Uh, at various temperature levels. This is from a grid pattern um, that she's established for changes in yield from changes in temperature. So I'm just going to take that as given for now and just talk to you about the results generally in the climate and trade model. So what I'm going to show you next is the key result using heat stress in terms of losses in agricultural and labor productivity with some limited sea level rise and storm surge in terms of losses in arable land for the 140 country climate and trade model. This is at RCP 8.5. We can do all the various RCPs that are relevant. I've taken the, the sort of more dramatic case as an example, although clearly still quite possible with temperature increases of 3.6 degrees. Current commitments would suggest that 2.6 is probably, or 2.7 is probably the, the outcome if people in fact follow their commitments, but it's quite possible that we'll have something higher than that in the three degree range. So these are the economic losses, again, from losses in agriculture and labor productivity, some limited sea level rise. Darker red is bad. These are losses in GDP. They're losses in incomes in percentage terms uh, going forward. Uh, which range, as you can see in the text, from a fall of 1% to 28%, depending on country, country. That's the average loss in GDP. Um, uh, as the, sorry, the average loss in GDP is 7%. The range is 1% to 28%. Now, let me just make this point. Ah, first, 
Um, I often get this criticism on Twitter. Uh, Greenland, Greenland is pink here, not because we have falls in income in Greenland. Greenland is picking up all the island states and countries that don't have resolution in the main map. So that's why it's pinkish. Um, Australia is pinkish here as well. If you can see it clearly on your screen, it's about a 4% loss in GDP on average. Again, with very limited damage functions, by the way. Right? It's, it's again, just loss in agricultural and labor productivity. So no fires and floods, no substantive sea level rise, no loss in biodiversity, no human health effects. None of that's included. Mm. And the picture I'm showing you uh, tries to make the point I made earlier. Look at the heterogeneity in damages. Huge damages in Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, somewhat in South America, and then lesser in other countries in terms of this heat stress index. The range is 1% to 28% fall in GDP. 28% is catastrophic. The average is 7%. The weighted average by GDP is about 3.5%. But if you're in Africa, you don't care about the average. You care about what's happening in your country. And if you try and average again across regions and countries, you're just going to miss that. And then with it, you're going to miss the change in trade patterns that go with these changes in incomes from global warming. Cumulative losses, if you added, this was 2100, the picture on the screen. Um, if you add up losses from now until 2100, and we can do, that, do this annually in this climate and trade model, it's about 610 trillion USD, which is about, as I say here, about seven and a half trillion per year over 80 years. So it's basically a COVID size shock 2021 each year for the next 80 years each year for the next 80 years. But of course, backloaded to the future because that's the nature of climate change and global warming. Although clearly impacts are happening now. One more little graphic. This is a distributional effect in terms of uh, this climate and trade, trade model at the same RCP in terms of country. So on the horizontal axis is income, on the vertical axis is impact. Um, you can see the country identifiers um, big circles mean big population like India and China. USA is here, Australia, Singapore, Philippines. Um, what's striking about the picture, of course, is that most of the damages, most of the impacts, most of the losses in income accrue to countries that are relatively poor, that have mean per capita GP, this blue line, um, that's below that. And it's a standard characteristic of these climate change models, really, in terms of their damage functions. Until you start including more substantive effects or additional substantive effects like sea level rise and storm surge, you get this pattern. Um, you can also do this model subnational for Australia, right? You can treat each, each individual state or territory in Australia as a country in this set of 140 different countries. And if you do that, you get uh, uh, you know, an interesting pattern of falls in, in state income going forward up to 2100. You can see in 2100, the fall in state income, again, just from this limited set of damage functions, loss in labor and ag productivity and limited sea level rise. Uh, Queensland, 17%, Tasmania, less than 1%. It underscores a point that, again, I keep making. Um, the national loss in GDP hides the distribution of the losses subnationally in Australia. Um, Queensland will be different than Tasmania for sure. And certainly in terms of this model context, losses in state income. Some people interpret this as a call to move to Tasmania. I'm not so sure that's okay or, or right. Everything will be impacted, but it does show again the heterogeneity within the country from these, these global warming effects. Now, the main point, right, we've got, if I just go back for a minute, we've got all these changes in income from global warming. We want to ask the question, what's the change in trade pattern that goes with it, given the change in income? And we can, we can feed that out. I've done one example here, just one example for Australia. This is the, the, the case of net change in imports to Australia 2100 among the top 20 exporters. We can do it for every exporter. Um, that's bringing goods and services into Australia across all 60 plus of these commodity uh, sectors. So red means a decline in trade going forward given global warming effects, so less imports from China. 
and Southeast Asia, more input imports, uh, blue means more import imports and the thicker the line, the larger the, the change in volume from, from Europe and, and other parts of the world. This is RCP 8.5, so we're still importing fossil fuels from UAE. That's why it's there. And in fact, importing less from New Zealand, which is an interesting paradox, as you'll see. We also did the same thing for New Zealand. It's a bit, a bit sort of more elaborate in terms of its change in trade patterns. Uh, you can see though, basically the same outcome, less, less imports from Asia and Southeast Asia, more from the rest of the world, including the United States and from Australia, big thick line from Australia to New Zealand. Uh, so for New Zealand, that's a change in the, in the trade pattern that sort of highlights uh, potential incursions of pests and diseases that are coming now with greater volume potentially into New Zealand from Australia. And that's why we're doing this. We're trying to find out what the, the sort of pest pathways would be from changes in trade patterns. So again, you can always, this is the New Zealand case, you can always map this. You can map this to um, all the countries in the model. I've only showed 20 exporters here. I can't fit everything on the screen. And for all the commodities. So on the vertical axis here is all the countries. Australia is a good one to indicate here for New Zealand. And on the horizontal axis are the GTAP codes for all these commodities. And again, I've only listed some of them. Uh, but you can see a um, large increase in terms of imports into New Zealand from Australia. And other places as well. So that's the whole point of the climate and trade model. We can connect changes in trade patterns from global warming to changes in trade for all these countries, all, all 140 countries, all 60 commodity groups. The next step then is to, uh, is to use Jimmy's risk mapping and climate host suitability and interception data along trade pathways uh, to sort of think about what the risk would be to Australia from these effects that are coming uh, with global warming. And again, he's done an example in a previous seminar, seminar about BMSB, uh, which is a, a real nuisance pest. Uh, which tends to hitchhike. It, uh, it hides in containers and comes in all kinds of things and uh, across the border, very hard to identify in some cases. Uh, it's got a big range in East Asia, but it's also invaded parts of the USA and, and Europe. And Jimmy's been able to, uh, before introducing this material into the climate and trade model, been able to map changes in pest pathways just from basic trade data. So that he's got sort of BSB, BMSB country effects, source risks, going forward, uh, where China's a big risk, uh, Spain less so in terms of this graphic, noting that not all of the infected countries are included. And then to map that into exposure ranks for the top here, he's listed the top 15 uh, currently non-infected countries with BMSB, um, based upon BSM, BMSB interception of trade data. Uh, Australia number one, as you can see, and uh, it goes from Australia all the way down to Portugal. And in fact, since doing this work, uh, Poland has now had several incursions of BMSB. It was ranked four before, and it's already suffered some incursions. Not clear about establishment yet, but there's clearly a problem in Poland uh, from BMSB. So I've got a few minutes left. Instead of closing, I'm just going to show you some of the results you know, from the, the water stress index. What we're using here is uh, an index that asks the question, what happens to irrigated water for agriculture on the one hand, or changes in water basins with global warming on the other hand, using IPCC and other material, uh, material from World Resources Institute or Water Resources Institute to find out what would happen to agricultural production going forward. I just wanna show you a couple slides and then I'll stop talking. This is a, this is, reduction of global food supply in 2050 with RCP 4.5. So that's more or less 2.8 degree warming, kind of what we're on target for given current commitments. Um, it's measured now in terms of thousands of giga, giga calorie falls in food output. Not done in value terms, but in falls in calories because uh, we're interested in food security ultimately and we want to have a calorie, calorie measure. And you can see there's uh, considerable falls in China and other parts of the world, some fall one and one and a half to three percent, or maybe four percent in Australia at this RCP. Um, Twenty one hundred, it's more dramatic, up to a thirty percent fall 
more and more in Australia and falls throughout the rest of the world. This is, this is combined, it should be clear, this is a combined heat stress and water stress index in this climate and trade model, looking at the effects of both impacts on agricultural production. Yeah. Red is bad, of course, in this sort of setting, uh, but every part of the world is affected. So it's basically, uh, Africa is not as red in this sort of graphic because it's basically an irrigation index, which isn't very common there. And then you get the very, very clear global food insecurity results. These are for the most severe cases, okay, cases where um, a percentage of the population has less calories, less than uh, 1,200 calories per day to eat going forward. Um, in 2100 at 4.5, it's pretty dramatic. You know, there are parts of Africa where more than half the population um, won't have sufficient calorie intake each day. But that's what the model can do. And then indeed from that, it can track, can track again, changes in trade patterns uh, and with it changes in tra trade test pathways. Um, and indeed that sort of occurs to me as I'm talking, that's one thing that we could do. Given that we have these trade patterns, that are that are also that are changing radically. We can ask the question: What's the impact in terms of biosecurity events in Australia that go with those trade patterns? Right, we're forming a mapping between global warming, changes in income and trade, and changes in pest pathways. We could go a step further and ask the question: Well, given the changes in pest pathways, um, what are the potential economic implications or damages to the economy, to portfolio assets and environmental assets in Australia? Uh, with different biosecurity measures in place. Traditionally for us, system on, system off in terms of the biosecurity system. That would complete the entire picture and give us a really clear sort of indication of what the threats are going forward. I'm going to stop there now with my favorite, uh, favorite cartoon. These are scientists who are trying to flatten the curve for COVID, um, but the real damages are coming unless we do something quickly about it. So thank you everyone for listening. Happy to take questions. I'll stop sharing and come back on video. Fantastic. Thanks, Tom. That was very, very informative. Um, really looking forward to continuing the project with you and understanding the results. I think we've got a question straight up from Darren. Did you want to ask? Yeah, hi Tom. Darren Peck, Director of NARC's Plant and Animal Surveillance uh, based in Cairns. Really interesting talk. I guess I'm interested in your last summary, I guess, in terms of, um, you know, biosecurity measures and where we, I guess what I'm interested in, how do you operationalise that? How will that inform what we do on the ground, in the field, at the border, mm -hmm. to, I guess, make us more agile, allow us to invest more strategically in biosecurity measures? How will it sort of inform that side of things at the coalface, if you know what I mean? Does that make sense? No, it makes perfect sense. Thanks, Darren. In fact, that's the whole point of the project in a way, is to try and provide some indication about what might be coming along these, these trade and pest pathways, um, which for us is kind of a sort of the sort of thing we do normally anyway. SEBRA has a value of biosecurity model that asks the question with different arrival and establishment rates with the biosecurity system on or off, what are the impacts to a whole host of portfolio and environmental assets? So we've already got the structure in place to do that kind of thing that you just suggested. If we have changes in pest pathways and new introductions of exotic pests and diseases, we should be able to calculate what the threat is in terms of loss and asset values going forward. Um, so what, what this model does is perhaps adjust the, the likelihood of arrival of things that we care about and want to prevent from, from establishing and spreading across Australia. It's really, in a sense, the whole point of doing the work. Wonderful. Thanks, Thanks Tom. Tom. Um, I, I guess I've got a question. Is there anyone else doing this kind of research or are we the only ones or are we aware of other people doing this kind of research and overlaying these sorts of information together? Oh, wow. Um, so I think we're the only ones doing very large dimensional climate and trade modelling um, and we're the only ones doing it in an intertemporal forward looking context. That's clear. Um, I think we're the only ones doing things like Jimmy's risk mapping and uh, 
using interception data to establish likelihoods of, of things arriving and establishing. You know, Jimmy's risk mapping work is just fantastic. I think it's, it's uh, world leading. A lot of people do work on losses in agricultural productivity from heat stress. Uh, but what Christine is doing is adding in precipitation effects and using a different model structure to kind of get really more sophisticated outcomes. And that's what's needed because everything that's that's driving this sort of model is in fact contingent on the damage functions. And if they're done in a crackerjack way, you know, we get better predictors, get better outcomes. So I'd like to say the answer is no. I think we're the ones who are doing this. Um, yeah, I think that's that's right. What's your plans on sharing it? Obviously, obviously, there's work with the department, and once we finish it, we will publish the report. But has Sebra got other plans of kind of getting this information out there and collaborating with others? Oh, yeah, we're keen to do that. Again, we're already working with New Zealand, and we're happy to work with other countries. Um, yeah, we're going to showcase this as heavily as possible. Don't want it just to be a report sitting on a shelf. And in fact, we were, we're hoping that the department uses this information to think about what happens at the border and how you might adjust uh, adjust uh, border activities given the change in pest pathways. It's it's designed to be operational, to be used. Um, um, it's got a it's got a nice a nice large academic component attached to it, and there'll be a series of publications. That's great for us at Melbourne Uni, but we really care in Sebra about having an impact, a policy impact. So we want the department to use the information to inform its planning, not just for 2100, of course, but for each year from now until 2100, because uh, the model can do that. It can map out everything annually. Um, that's why that's why we sit in Sebra. I don't sit in an economics department because I just, yeah, I want to have an impact. And that's what we're trying to do here. Wonderful. Uh, Peter, Kayla? <laughs> Some people in economics departments do have impacts as well, but mm, not for me. Anyway. So, hi, Tom. Great Peter. talk. Um, I've got a much more general question, which is a bit of a bad philosophy. It seems to be that most of your talk is actually really getting down to the detail of what we can actually look at what's going to happen because of climate change, both in terms of, you know, the actual pathways and right down to really very nitty gritty stuff. It's always seemed to me that climate change has used temperature as a proxy, like global warming, two degrees, right? And in terms of actually getting people on board with what the problem is, I'd argue that that's not a good description. Like two degrees, you know, okay, summer's day of 25, turns to 27, that's not a problem. If it's 35, well, 37 might be a problem, but I'll live with it, given all the other stuff I'd have to do to mitigate it. Whereas what you're pointing out, and I think what would be better if it was more of the part of the conversation, is the actual detrimental things, which probably in the first instance, I'd argue are extreme events the likelihood of extreme events like floods and droughts and stuff happening, and therefore their effect on our lives, our economies and everything else. So do you have any general comment on that? Yeah, no, so it's a really good point, Peter. Um, and and I, I normally have a slide that sort of captures that sort of issue, because you know, if you have a small change, say a one or two degree change in global temperature, what happens is you get more extreme events, the tail of the distribution extends. So. Uh, small changes in average temperatures can generate large, large sort of extreme events at the tail of the distribution, and that's what you find in these damage functions. So you're you're spot on. Um, basically, it's shifting the distribution of temperatures and generating more extreme events. That's the problem. So floods, fires, sea level rise, storm surge, um, yeah, heat stress, water stress. Those are the things that happen. The average temperature is really hiding those extreme events. Um, and what this work is in a sense trying to do is bring them out in a better way in terms of economic losses. But point point well taken, you're spot on. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Okay, I've just got a question in the chat from Justin Billing. He says, uh, with the changing trade pathway slide, is it the same products we'll get from Europe as we've previously got from Asia or are the products changing with different availability? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we can feed all that out for you, Justin. You know, we 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 can we the, the model generates the outcomes that are that are relevant. And you know, from the look of that, from the look of it, it's really changes in commodity trade patterns as well as as using traditional things from Southeast Asia. I mean, there'll be some things that can't be grown in Southeast Asia, so you'll have to find alternatives. And that's what the model output tends to show. Um, uh, but it's complicated, right? It's 140 countries and 
you know, 60 different commodity groups. So um, trying to track everything is really a bit of a challenge. We'll try and find a way to do that, of course, and make it sort of easy to represent in some sort of graphical form. We're not there yet, uh, but with your help and and the help of DAF, DAF colleagues, we'll get there. Okay, and just one more from Christine Horlock. Are there any positive impacts? So if, as an example, increased CO2 can drive increased plant productivity uh, and how can any positives be accounted for? Yeah, so so in standard climate models, you still get that outcome. It's a very good question. Uh, there are parts of, of Canada and Russia, maybe Greenland or even further north, if you get uh, very, very crazy and extreme, that would in fact be in a sense better off. Uh, with rising CO2 levels. Those were the early results in sort of standard climate change models. But when you put it into an economic model, um, and I'm not sure that's true anymore in standard climate change models, but if you put it into an economic model, um, um, you know, which, which is trying to take into account the interactions between economies in this global economy, uh, no one's really safe anymore. Um, because falls in income, you know, the war in Ukraine is a good example, uh, you know, huge disruption globally even though it's you know, fairly isolated from Australia, but a huge disruption. The same thing would happen here with climate change going forward. Um, when countries are having catastrophic losses from global warming, it's going to affect the whole economy of every country uh, throughout the world. There'll be global impacts. And I think, I think current climate science, I'm not a climate scientist clearly, but current climate science suggests that even, even northern regions of Russia and Canada will still struggle at degrees, temperature degrees, more than three degrees. So. And certainly more than two degrees even. They see they see two degrees as an alarm bell generally throughout the world. So that old that old sort of, oh yeah, CO2 is beneficial. Yeah, you're right. But when you combine it with water stress and heat stress, whoa, look out, it's trouble, right? Because it's not just CO2, you've got to account for water and heat as well and other things. Okay, um, we've got some more from Anna, obviously. Uh, should we be concerned about the viticulture in Australia and New Zealand when considering climate change, trade and pests? Yes, simple, simple. I mean, there's, so what we do at Sebra is trying to find all of the asset layers that are relevant to things like this. And they're huge. And at the moment we have 14 major asset layers that are relevant. Um, the standard ones, you know, agriculture and portfolio assets, but also environmental assets, marine assets, all the things that are here potentially affected. That's that's another part of the challenge here. Um, when you construct these damage functions, you're looking not at just at trades in, in goods and services, given changing trade patterns, but the, the assets that will be impacted as a result of global warming. Um, so there's work to be done there for us, but we're getting we're getting better, getting a fuller picture. So yes, indeed. Okay, and we've got one from Andrew. Uh, can the food security outcomes be translated directly to human impacts? Okay. Um, yeah, well, so at cal calorie counts less than 1,200 a day, you bet. Um, there, there'll be a considerable starvation. You know, when I present this material in, in Europe, um, which I used to do before COVID, we had early versions of this. The first question they ask, um, I'm in a seminar, say, in France. The first question they ask is, what will happen to migration given these changes? Because um, if people are starving, they're going to move. And they're really quite concerned about that in Europe um, for, for a number of reasons. Um, so there will be there will be severe sort of global impacts potentially coming if these sort of temperature changes, you know, in fact, occur going forward. Um, but yeah. Uh, the, the, the severe food insecurity case was designed to show that, in fact, you get extreme levels of uh, food insecurity going forward with uh, changes in temperature. You know, in Africa, sort of more than 60% of the population doesn't have 1,200 calories per day. It's a disaster, a total disaster. Okay, I think that's all of the questions there today. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we do have one more seminar coming up later in the year. Um, we'll be sending out some more information on that one soon, uh, but that will be our final one for the year. Uh, but again, thanks everyone for coming and thank you, Tom, for that insightful presentation. Really enjoyed it um, and look forward to seeing the work. Yeah, no, thanks everyone for tuning in. I know it's not a happy story, um, but it's something we have to keep in mind to do something about. Mitigation still is in play. And, you know, we need to think about adaptation measures and in particular how we protect against uh, dangerous pests and diseases coming to Australia as a result of these global warming impact. So follow up with me if you like um, by email and thanks again for coming.